and uh, welcome to the Electrical Engineering um, Spring Colloquium. It's a pleasure to welcome our speaker today, uh, Luis Cese from uh, the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, our neighbor. Um, Luis's research focuses on the intersection of uh, computer architecture, programming languages, operating systems, and biology, which you'll hear about today. He's a recipient of the NSF Career Award, a Sloan Research Fellowship, um, a Microsoft Research Faculty Fellowship, and also the 2013 IEEE uh, TCCA Young Computer Architect Award. Um, Luis is from Brazil, where it rains all the time, and he has moved here to Seattle, where it also rains all the time, except for today. Um, when he's not working, um, he's found either eating or cooking, so that's a fantastic topic to speak with uh, Luis about. So it's a pleasure to welcome Luis. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for the kind introduction. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I have to say it's a bit um, weird being back here giving a talk here because last time I was giving a talk here and looking up I was interviewing for a job, you know. Uh, uh, this was almost 10 years ago now. So anyways, thanks for giving me the opportunity, Matt. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about um, two projects that I realized have some interesting connection on uh, building better computers. One project is getting an idea from nature uh, to improve efficiency of computer systems, and the other one is actually borrowing apart from nature uh, to, to build computers. And this is the result of a collaboration that involves many people, including people in the EE department, Georg Selig, uh, and Visvesh Sate, uh, and folks from Microsoft Research as well. So let me start by saying that uh, what kind of applications we use computers for today? You know, if you look at things like, you know, uh, uploading pictures to the web, you know, in fact, this number is old. Uh, today is more like more than half a billion pictures are uploaded to Facebook every day. Half a billion pictures, okay? So the traffic on the internet, more than a third uh, is Netflix, especially when House of Cards is, is released, you know? Um, and then YouTube, like it actually upload four, um, we have 100 hours of video per minute, and uh, we have four billion video views a day, okay? And if you look at your phone, most of the, the data goes to music, uh, photos, and, and, and video. Okay, and then we have, you know, we're doing robotic, robotics control, virtual reality, and now and I know you've heard a million times about deep neural networks. I promise I'm not gonna talk about deep neural networks, I'm just mentioning briefly later. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that, you know, these applications really today consume most of the cycles of compute, bytes of storage, and network bandwidth uh, that we have. So the input uh, to these applications is often inexact by nature because they come from sensors. And all of these applications have multiple acceptable outputs. Okay, so this is where our cycles go today. But yet, we design computer systems like this. You know, we have physics at the bottom that we cannot change, right? And then we build circuits on top of that, then we build an architecture, then we have a compiler, language, an application. And all of this we try, we strive to make them general, precise, and mostly deterministic, okay? This is how we engineer systems. And I think, essentially, we're designing computers to run, you know, what we used to run in the 70s, you know, we run a spreadsheet, okay? And I think this comes at a big efficiency cost that I think it's pretty clear that we can't avoid anymore. So it's something that we can't afford, not we can't afford, we can't afford anymore. And you guys in EE know this much better than I do. You've heard a million times that, you know, Moore's Law is ending. You know, I just thought that, um, I would mention briefly that The Economist had a fantastic piece. I think it was the best piece on popular uh, media on the end of Moore's Law, okay? And it's worth looking at it. And this is one plot that shows how many transistors it gets per dollar. And then just in 2015, it's actually decreased. We get fewer transistors per dollar than we used to get, okay? And then, there, and then there's another one here that shows, you know, people predicting the end of Moore's Law. You know, it's funny that Gordon Moore himself, you know, said it would end in 2005, and then he actually, this is based on, on economic reasons, and he goes and revises his prediction saying it's gonna end by, because of physics reasons in 2025, okay? But my favorite quote about Moore's Law is the following, is that, you know, Doug Carmine, a friend of mine, uh, said, you know, the number of people predicting that Moore's Law doubles every year. I thought it was a cute uh, quote to mention here. The reason I'm mentioning this is that, you know, we need to find ways to build better computers, okay? So we can't just rely on sitting around and make, you know, the great uh, device technology get better and the secret engineers getting, you know, clever and clever. There's a limit. We're getting, pr we're approaching the, the atomic limit, right? So essentially, I think that approximate computing is one one idea that could be promising in building better computers. So what is approximate computing? So approximate computing essentially, it exploits the inherent application level resilience and redundancy that exists in the application itself to make computers more efficient. Remember the applications that I showed earlier? They all 
they do not need precise computing. They do not need all bytes of storage to be perfect. They do not need all bytes of communication to be perfect. They, they don't need com computation to be perfect, okay? So essentially, what I want to do is sort of like honor the application, of course, I cannot change physics, but everything in between, let's just relax that, those interfaces to get more efficiency, okay? So in a sense, what we want to do is sort of build this knob that trades off efficiency and performance, for, uh, trades off output accuracy for better efficiency and better performance throughout the stack. You know, the circuit layer and the architecture interface, the compiler, the language, and so on, okay? In a sense, what we wanna do is, by the way, who read this book? Do you know this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, by Daniel Kahneman? He's a, a Nobel laureate, you know, he's, uh, it's worth, he's, he's, essentially his work is on decision making. He talks about, you know, decision making in human brains, such as it uses two systems, system one and system two. System one is when you do this very quick decision that's mostly accurate that you can do without really putting efforts. And system two is what you invoke and you need to do a detailed, more, you know, much more carefully done decision that's tiring, makes you tired, makes you want to drink more coffee and so on. Okay, so we do, we do that in nature all the time. This, this is how brains work. So we wanna do that with computer systems, okay? So in a sense, more technically, I would say that approximate computing, the goal is to specialize computation, storage, and communication to the properties of algorithms of these applications that I mentioned. Okay, so I wanna make data, relaxed data, relaxed computation, relaxed com, um, communication, okay? And here's a plot that I know that both Matt Reynolds and, and, um, and Josh Smith like to use in their talks about you know, uh, energy harvesting, how much you can do with one microjoule. Okay, so what this plot shows is how many instructions you can do per microjoule, and that's you know, the year, okay? And it's interesting that you know, we, we're doing a lot better when you look at uh, the brain, which is only gonna be released, in, be released in 2050, that's one the interesting thing in this plot. Have you noticed this? There's something interesting here, that it says that the human brain, uh, so brains are gonna be released only in 2040, which I always find, find uh, amusing. But anyways, what this is showing is that there's about six orders of magnitude difference here in uh, how much you can do, uh, how much computation you can do per unit of energy in natural brains versus what you can do with electronics. I think that's really, really remarkable, okay? But now you might be wondering, wait, so what are you talking about? You know, aren't, we, aren't we doing this for a long time? You know, isn't machine learning, iterative algorithms, lossy compression, floating point, all ideas and things that use approximation? Yes, that's true. They've been done in isolation and mostly at the application, the algorithm level. What we want to do is sort of like push this down, all the way down the stack. So what I'm gonna be telling you about a little bit today is essentially how do you take advantage of approximation throughout the stack? The language level, uh, and then compiler optimizations, approximate execution models, and so on. And why are we doing this? Well, there's, there's huge potential. Can, can you guys see the laser pointer here? Yeah, okay. So, for example, uh, there's some folks at MIT and some of work in our group that's been showing that if you compile a program in a slightly relaxed way, meaning that it's not perfect, okay? So you can skip some loop iterations or you can reduce the, um, the precision of computations by reducing the bit width, um, or you essentially change the multiplication by a bit shift and so on, a bunch of tricks. You know, you can actually get 4x better performance with typically not noticeable uh, degradation in quality, okay? So I'm gonna talk about approximate execution models. When you don't quite execute the program, you use a prediction of what the program does. You can actually get at least 10x energy efficiency, okay? And then some other things like, you know, unsafe hardware operation mode, say sub-thresholds, you know, sub nominal voltage operation, or even, you know, if you go to analog, if you, instead of using digital uh, logic, you use analog circuits, then you, can, then, you, then you crack the digital barrier and you can get 100x, maybe 1,000x, and so on, and we have experts on that here. So let me do a very quick, simple warm-up exercise here, okay? So let me give you an example. So this is a ray tracer that we ran a long time ago in, in one of their, our very first approximate computing infrastructures that does the following. So this is a ray tracer. The upper left here is perfect. The right one is a little less perfect. This one is, you know, you start seeing bad pixels, and this one is really bad. You can see the bad pixels, okay? What if I told you that, you know, hypothetically, that this one here is perfect, they, uh, has no errors, but use a lot of energy. This one has little errors, and then has less energy and so on. Let's do a personality test here, okay, just for a second. Who choose this one? Raise your hand. Who choose the perfect one? Okay, all right, people move. Who choose this one, the big risk takers? All right, how about this one? And this one? Aha, uh -huh. you see the majority is always right, you know, so that's the one, all right. So Matt's gonna give you a t-shirt after the, all right. 
So it turns out that this actually holds, and we've done a bunch of studies uh, using Mechanical Turk to get to see what people think of that. So we did a bunch of degradations on the, uh, on the output of some image manipulation uh, applications and some uh, things like ray tracing too. Um, and we uh, showed them a bunch of images and asked them to say which ones are acceptable. And for one set of people, we didn't tell them anything. There's no trade-off, just like tell us which ones are good, okay? And then, so and that's the, the ones without a trade-off. And then for another set of people, we told them like, look, if you choose the ones that are less good, your, battery, your phone battery is gonna last uh, an hour or two longer. So those people are actually much more tolerant of, um, of degraded output, okay? I think that's really interesting because it shows that if you give people an incentive, they're actually willing to take a less good output uh, for um, you know, longer battery life or lower power bill and so on. But here's the catch. You have to do approximation very, very carefully because if you're not careful in how you do the approximation, the execution, instead of getting something like this, you get something like this, okay? You had a, a blue screen or uh, you, you, you don't get any output or you're all corrupted and so on. So the question is, how do we actually make this work? And, uh, and the message here is that it has to do with co-design. If you just do approximation at the hardware level, it's clearly not safe. If you have a process that executes things approximately without the software knowing, you're probably gonna cause a crash and not gonna produce the right, uh, the right output, okay? And I would say that just doing approximation at the algorithm level, which is what we do today, by running machine learning algorithms or even floating points, so I, I would say that this is suboptimal, okay? And finally, if you assume reliable hardware for inherently robust algorithms, just a big waste, okay? So there's three questions that we answered in approximate computing. First one at the language level is uh, what and how to approximate. So when you're writing a code, how do you specify a piece of code? How do you specify what can be approximated, what has to be precise, okay? And then uh, the other question is how, how good is my output? When I'm running this program and I produce an output, how do I reason about whether the output is good enough for the application, okay? And third, you know, how do you take advantage of it? Once you've written a program like that, how do you um, take advantage of that, okay? So here's, let me just briefly tell you um, some answers to these questions, just as one of you, and if you have more questions, my office happens to be just right there, so these guys can stop by. And ask questions anytime here, too, but I know this room is intimidating, so. Scott, you had a question? No. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I have, no, I have an approximate sense of direction here, you know. So, so here's how the programming model works. It's very, it's very, very simple, okay? So we asked the programmer to, to essentially classify data into two categories, you know, precise data and approximate data. Okay, precise data are things that have strict correctness constraints. These are things like, you know, pointers, uh, you know, uh, instruction pointers, data pointers, things like headers that have, piece of data that have a, a lot of importance, okay? And then approximate things are like pixel data, neuron weights in the neural network, uh, uh, video frames, and so on. And then the system enforces the following discipline, okay? So precise data can affect approximate data, but approximate data cannot affect precise data. So if you've done security before, if you've done information flow tracking, it's exactly the same thing. But, but with, with security, you have uh, classified data and non-classified data. We use the same idea, but we use for you know, relaxing the, the correctness constraints of data. So as long as the programmer gives us this, uh, classifies the data, and the system follows this, this discipline, then we can approximate everything that touches approximate data as long as we leave precise data alone, okay? And this is what we did with the language extension uh, that uses a type system to do that. So the idea here is the following. We had a set of type qualifiers um, that determines whether a piece of data can be approximate or it has to be precise. And then the type checker says that if you have a approximate expression, you cannot assign it to a precise variable. But if you have a precise expression, you can assign it to an approximate value. So the type checker does that for you. And every time um, it doesn't, you don't follow the decision. If, if you have a, a, a type error, you just go like, wait, I'm actually moving approximate data to precise data. You should go and look at your code and do a type casting much in the same way that you do, um, that you do any, any, type, um, any types, okay? So once you have that, a lot of things just follow, just falls from that. Um, first thing is if you just using operator overloading, whatever has approximate operands can be done approximately. So I can do an approximate add here in these two cases, for example. If I have two precise operands, then I cannot do the operation approximately, okay? 
Uh, but now often you have to endorse values. You know, many times when you do computation in an approximate world, you might eventually want to do, to show it to the user or you want to interact with the rest of the system. So you often have to move data from the approximate world to the precise world and you have to endorse it, okay? And here's another catch. Uh, why can't we do this, by the way? Is there any problem with this piece of code? Do I have any data flow from approximate to precise? I don't have a data flow, but I have a control flow, right? So I have precise data being affected by, uh, by approximate data. So we don't allow that either. You actually have to go and endorse that because then you have approximate data affecting precise data. So again, same thing with security, okay? So the reason I show this is that, and we have a new version too, by the way, you can actually make uh, approximation be continuous. It's not a binary thing. It's either approximate or precise. You can say how approximate it is. And it is a bunch of things we had to do to actually do the type checking for that. And, Subject for another talk, okay? Um, so anyway, so this is, this, this is what the programming model for Proxima computing looks like, and it's very, very simple, but it turns out it works well. We've written a bunch of code using it, and there's a whole infrastructure um, uh, available on, on GitHub that people are using to write code this way. So it'd be interesting to see that it actually works. Okay, once you write code like this, you have to run it, okay? When you run it, you have to decide whether the output is good enough. So we, de we define this, this term called Quality of result, okay, so you've heard quality of service before in networking, right, which is, has to do with performance, how, you know, has to do with time. Quality of result has to do with the bits of output. Okay, so how good is the output of an application? And this is application dependent. For example, if you're doing image processing, you'll be the percentage of bad pixels, okay? Or if you're doing uh, scientific computing, you'll be deviation from expected value. Um, if you're doing image classification, it will be how often you, you classify an image wrong and so on. Okay, so what I want to do is to do something like this, okay, in specifying uh, the, the quality checks in, um, in, a, in a program, to be able to say, I wanna compute something approximately, okay, store it in a, in a variable, and then I wanna say, I want to assert that the difference between the precise value and the approximate value has to be lower than a certain threshold. But the question here is the following. If I do this, so how do I actually check this in a cheap way? Can I just execute the program twice, execute precisely and approximately and compare? Is that a smart thing to do? <laughs> no, then you lose all the benefit, right? So um, that's so why we actually use a bunch of techniques that uses probabilistic reasoning to determine whether or not this holds. So uh, I don't wanna give too much detail on this because it can be you know, boring, but here's how it works at a high level, okay? You write a program in our model and you give a distribution of how the inputs look like and how the errors look like, okay? And then we actually build a Bayesian inference network that is equivalent to the program that shows how errors propagate in your code. And then we can actually prove whether or not we can actually honor the quality specifications just, just with probabilistic reasoning in most cases, okay? Uh, not all cases. Um, the reason is that sometimes we don't know this, this distribution. <laughs> you don't know what the input distribution is, you don't know what the error distribution is. So we ha actually have to do uh, quality checks dynamically. Okay, so it essentially built both a hardware mechanisms and uh, software mechanisms that do things like this. You know, I'm executing the code from time to time, I actually sample and execute it, that, bit, that little bit of code precisely and approximately, and I compare whether that um, is lower than a certain threshold, okay? So, um, and that bet uh, on the behavior being, you, you executing things in a streaming way, if from time to time you're wrong, you can actually check that and that's gonna hold uh, through the execution so you can predict the future, okay? Um, anyways, and we use things like from time to time you, you can write applications that have, they're expensive to compute but cheap to check. These are things like satisfiability uh, solving, like if you, it's very hard to compute but easy to, to check, so you can put cheap checks. Um, or um, we do things like fuzzy memoization. If you have a piece of code that's executing over and over and over again, when I look at, um, when I see a new piece of code that operates on slightly different data, I use the previous output as a predictor for the current output to compare, okay? And so on. Um, now, okay, so we know how to write, roughly know how to write code that has approximate components. We know how to check quality. The million dollar question now is, how do you take advantage of that? That's when we get closer to hardware, okay? That was just, you know, the software stack for us to be able to finally do approximation. And we've tried a bunch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about two examples. One is a microprocessor that has an, an approximate, uh, a precise data path and approximate data path. And then the other one is on using an accelerator that is approximate, okay? 
So the first one is the first one we tried years ago. Uh, was essentially a uh, typical microprocessor that had a data path that had uh, VDD high nominal voltage, and the other one is VDD low, a sub-threshold, like super low voltage, it could lead to errors. And then the software controls where it goes, okay? So, and then you had things like a register file um, and uh, storage elements that had uh, storage cells that, can, that you can set as either approximate or precise, depending on what data it's holding, okay? And, uh, and then functional units and data caches and so on. But the important part here is the following, is how we did it. Okay, so the compiler controls everything. So the, the hardware is completely, um, so the, the hardware completely trusts the compiler because this is really important. I want to be able to check those properties that I told you earlier of precise and approximate statically because if I have to actually do it dynamically, I'm gonna spend energy and I don't wanna do that. Okay, so the way we do this, as soon as our program passes the type checking, the compiler uses uh, uh, instruction set extensions to map some code to the approximate flaky part and some code to the precise part, okay? And then the, the compiler, uh, the processor blindly trusts it and executes it. Great, we did this, we designed a microprocessor, we did simulations and so on, and then we got 724, 7 to 24% energy savings. Is this worth the trouble? Eh, no, right? This is just like, what? Uh, you know, that's really not good because all of this trouble to save 24%. And there's, there's, there's a reason why, okay? So, does anybody want to guess? Why is it a so limited? Yeah? Lower voltage, right? Uh -huh. That implies that your computation can have an error. Right. But error and approximation are two different things. But right, we're, we're actually using probabilistic errors as a form of approximation. Okay, so there's many ways you can do approximation, right? You can do deterministic approximation by lowering the bit width, that would be deterministic. But the approximation here is essentially non-deterministic approximation that just uh, asks, uh, adds error with the probability, with the probability, okay? So but why is it that we uh, didn't save as much as we wanted? Yeah, Scott? Voltage level converters. Voltage level, that's voltage level converters, that's one guess, another guess. Let me ask you a question, can we approximate control circuitry? That's very hard, okay? So if you look at, you guys remember Amdahl's law here, right? Amdahl's law says that the benefit of, of your optimization is limited by how often you can apply the, uh, the optimization. It turns out that, you know, control circuitry is very hard to approximate. Things like instruction decoding, instruction caches, and so on are hard to approximate. So that means that it, it turns out in a modern microprocessor, more than about, actually roughly 50% of the, the logic and the energy actually devoted to control circuit, and you can't approximate that. So this is why we started looking at other ideas of doing approximation, and we arrived at the following observation, that we wanna do approximation in a way that um, we don't have to spend too much resources on control circuit, okay, in control circuitry. So we decided to use a neural network as a general um, approximation fabric, okay? So here's how it works, okay? We uh, defined this, this acceleration called neural acceleration. And you've used neural networks, in fact, I had promised I would not mention neural networks, but I can't resist, I'm gonna have to use it here. Um, we've used neural networks normally to learn programs and learn computations that we don't know how to specify. You want, it, you want it to emerge it from the data, right? What we're doing here is actually trying to use neural networks to approximate code that we know how to write. Okay, so here's how it works. Okay, you, you write your code, and then you've, the, with the, model that I just, programming model that I just showed you. And then the compiler finds uh, an approximate component, things that only have approximate outputs, okay? Then we train a neural network to behave like the code. And then once we train it enough, we just don't execute the code anymore, just execute it in a fast piece of hardware. That's dedicated, that's specialized to neural networks. So you see what I did here? Essentially, I don't execute the code anymore. I just predict the output and then take the, uh, take the outputs, okay? So we apply this to, so here's an example. Suppose I'm doing a Sobel filter, okay, just finding edges, and then eventually we're gonna have in the inner loop here uh, a function that computes the gradient. That's, that's nice and well defined, right? I have you know, a three by three um, matrix as input and a single float as output. This is fully approximate. I can just learn how this behaves and uh, don't uh, execute the code anymore, okay? So we, in fact, essentially we do that for the whole program we throw a bunch of cycles, we send this thing to EC2, 
we compile the program in a million ways. We check what parts of the code can be approximated by a neural network. The ones that work, we keep, uh, we use a neural network. The ones that don't, we don't, okay? Great, so, um, and then each piece of code actually leads to a different neural network configuration. Um, so let me give you a flavor of the results here. We actually had multiple implementations. One was like a digital uh, logic version, like an ASIC version. We had an analog version and an FPGA-based version that's actually available uh, open source if you wanna play with it. And then the results are kind of encouraging. We've, we uh, had speed ups uh, up to about 10x and energy savings up to about 20x in the, in the ASIC version and it kind of like translated to the FPGA version as well, okay? And um, one thing that's interesting to, to look at is why does this work, right? If you look at the following, okay? So say that I had, here are two examples of translating code from a von Neumann model to this neural model, okay? Um, so this edge detection, that's the case that I just showed you that computes the gradient. Okay, so the original code has 88 static uh, instructions. And then when I go and compile it to a neural network, it uh, leads to about 18 neurons and I think two or three layers, okay? Now if I look at triangle intersection, which is a more complex piece of code that's used in, in game, um, uh, in, in game physics engines, uh, we go from about 1,100 instructions to 60 neurons on, and two hidden layers. Okay, now I have another question for you. Which one do you think has more raw computation? This version or that version? Who thinks it's this version? Who thinks it's that version? Okay, it's actually the version on the right. The professor's normally right, so only professor raise their hand. So what's going on here? You know, it's interesting. I'm doing more computation, but I'm about, you know, 20x more efficient. Again, you know, uh, what we did, we actually, we're not executing the code pre precisely, right? And it's just an approximation of the execution. But the reason that this is more efficient is because I pay 10 to save 100. So this, I can actually use on a much more efficient hardware, okay? And because neural networks are, again, nature is smart, right? So it's actually very regular and easy to compute. So you can actually have very efficient implementations. So this transformation here has some cost, but we get that back and then some. Okay, and this is interesting because by doing this transformation, now I can get things that are written in C, it can execute in, a, in an analog fabric even, okay? So that, that works super well. Um, okay, so let me change gears a little bit here. Uh, we've done approximation in a bunch of parts of a computer system. I mentioned mainly CPU and processing, but we apply this to storage. I don't have time to tell you about this, but we, we've used this to essentially show that if you don't need perfect error correction on pieces of data like images and video and so on. You can actually take advantage of how the cells work and then encode the images and video in a different way that's not perfect but leads to, to um, often like 50% extra density and like a few percent uh, bit error, okay? And we also did that for Wi-Fi communications. Wi-Fi wi -Fi is interesting, if you look at um, Wi-Fi packets, and you, as you increase the bit rate, you're gonna drop more packets, right? So what we did, we actually looked at when packets are dropped because they had errors, we look how many bits were off, and often you have just a handful of bits that uh, were bad. So we, we built a, a networking stack uh, on top of, um, of Wi-Fi that actually um, essentially lets the programmers say, just forward up, you know, send all the, the packets that the CRC doesn't check. Uh, for the applications we use, and we built a browser on top of that. It was interesting. We could get 2x, um, we actually built a simple browser on top of that, and we had 2x better page load with nearly uh, imperceptible uh, quality degradation, okay? So any questions about approximation? If you wanna try it, by the way, you can uh, download the code and a bunch of examples from our website. Uh, so people are using it, would love to hear your, your feedback, okay? Questions? Matt, and I'm gonna change gears now, yeah. Oh, okay, do you think that uh, analog ALUs or you know, analog coprocessors are the way to go, or do you think it's a more creative use of digital logic? Great question. Uh, I have a lot of hopes for analog. Um, um, I don't know much about analog circuit design, but you know, from, from what I've seen, I think there's a lot of opportunities to actually build analog functional units, as long as you can make the AD and the A converters efficient enough, so you can stitch them digitally. Uh, with, with, with digital signals, I think it'll be great, you know, so, yeah. Yeah? Uh, I have a question from a biologist. Um, 
for the neural networks and the hardware solution, would parallelized field programmable gate, array, gate arrays uh, be a good solution? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, one of the implementations that I mentioned uses FPGAs. Cool. Okay. Great, great question. Yeah. It's on the approximation. Yeah. So right now, you either have approximation or precise. Do you have something <coughs> in between, like the order mix to the, you know, in terms of the order of approximation? Great question. So the, the the question was like, do we have anything beyond just I mentioned, mainly mentioned, uh, talked about the binary uh, approximation, either approximation, approximate or precise. The question was, can we actually make it continuous? Yes, and in fact, we have a type system that allows you to specify how approximate you want a piece of data to be. And then you can compute how relaxed each operation that data has to be to honor a given level of approximation. Yeah, we, we have that too. The problem is that that's, a, that's a subject for a whole nother talk. But yeah, so we do have that. That's, that's, that's a great suggestion, so. Okay, so that was the, you know, I know it was varying levels of detail. I hope it didn't bore you too much, but you know, there's plenty of work in that space, not only by our group, but by other um, groups around the world too. And this idea is starting to pick up, right? Because that's, uh, that's a way that allows you to apply optimizations that you couldn't apply before. And, and it's interesting that that's how a lot of our brains work too. Like we don't do anything precisely, but we do things very, very efficiently. Speaking of that, so we, we talked about Moore's law ending, right? But um, as if there, would, there, there weren't enough bad news. There's another thing that I thought was interesting to point out. So the IDC did this study recently that showed data production in the world versus our ability to store it, okay? So the red line here is what we call the digital universe that's been going exponentially, and the blue line here is the installed capacity that actually includes all of forms of storage produced in the world and uh, cumulatively, okay? So that's flash, tape, disk, optical media, and so on. Well, there's definitely a gap here, right? You know, there's a lot of pictures of cats, babes, babies, and et cetera, that we can't store, okay? So, uh, well, you know, that's actually worrisome to some people. It turns, sure, there's a lot of this information here that's not useful, but there's a lot of information that is useful that we would like to be able to store, okay? And in fact, uh, Archivo is, is big business. If you look at, so Facebook built a, a one exabyte um, data center. Uh, I think about a year or so ago, uh, it's 66,000 66, square feet, about the size of a, of a Walmart, okay? And the capacity is one exabyte. That's for archival storage, okay? By that, I mean data that you do not access very frequently, and, uh, and it's not meant to be accessed with short latencies, it's, it's archival, okay? If you, if you were to get all of that data and store it in, in DNA, it would be about a cubic uh, inch. Okay, so, and we think that you know, this is an idea that's been around for some time now, uh, for about three decades now, the original idea was three decades ago, on using DNA for, for synthetic DNA for data storage, okay? So why are we thinking about this? Well, uh, DNA is extremely dense and space has a cost, okay? So if the denser you can make it, uh, the better. So you have roughly uh, one exabyte in one, uh, that's, that's one cubic inch here, so. The, um, and also extremely durable, the half-life, is about uh, 500 years, okay? And here's the other thing that's my favorite. The readers never become obsolete, okay? So as long as you have DNA-based life on Earth, there'll be a reason to read it, okay? So, but let me be a little more scientific and show you how DNA compares to other storage technologies, okay? So this is a study that, that we've done uh, that I thought was interesting that showed the y-axis here is density in gigabits per cubic millimeter, and then uh, these are multiple storage technologies, okay? We have disk. SSDs, tape, and so on. And if you look at how DNA compares with tape, for example, tape is actually the densest form of storage you can buy today, okay? So there's about nine orders of magnitude improvement, okay? And that, uh, sure, you have to take some overhead off here, but you know, the potential is nine, nine orders of magnitude. Uh, the lifetime here is interesting too, so disk is rated between three to five years, uh, optical is about 100, tape is maybe 30 years, and DNA will be easily be 1,000 years if you keep it in the right conditions, okay? Uh, and then there's a cost here that we can talk about that later, so don't look at the cost right now. Great, so we decided to uh, build uh, a DNA-based archival storage system. This is a project that's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's a collaboration between um, CSC, EE, and, and Microsoft Research, and the idea is the following, right? We wanted to build a system that you, you get digital data, you encode into DNA in the right process, you store it away, and when you read it, you sequence it back and get all the data back, okay? 
So we've made three contributions in this work so far. The first one is another way, is one way of adding enough redundancy in a way that you don't lose so much density to, uh, uh, and you provide error correction. We did a bunch of wet lab experiments I'm gonna talk about in a bit. And also we showed the way of, uh, of making retrieval efficient with random access, okay, and using trivial uh, molecular biology uh, tools, okay? So let's, let's talk about the DNA manipulation uh, for a second here. So we need two things, right, to store data in DNA. We need a way of manufacturing DNA molecules that encodes the data, and we need a way to read the DNA back and decode it into the original digital data, okay? So the first step is called synthesis. We're gonna be able to manufacture DNA strands. And the way it works is there's a bunch of techniques, but they all boil down to a chemical synthesis process that appends one nucleotide at a time, okay? So in the practical length, by the way, that we can do with DNA synthesis today is about 200 nucleotides, okay? So 200 nucleotides before uh, it, you have too much error and so on, okay? And then typically this process produces many thousands of copies of each molecule, and you can make a bunch of sequences in parallel in the surface, okay? So there's this, we call microarray micro -array synthesis, where you grow a bunch of different DNA sequences uh, at the same time, okay? So that's DNA synthesis. And now DNA sequencing is a process of getting the molecules and reading them and, the, and reading what letters composes, uh, what nucleotides composes that, uh, that molecule. Okay, typically that produces a large number of reads of a strand. You can get multiple shots at reading it. And, and uh, right now it's actually much higher throughput uh, than synthesis, okay? So now let's think about how we actually encode digital data into DNA. So the most trivial way would be the following. You had the long binary string, okay? You're going to map that from base two to base three sorry, base two to base four, <laughs> and uh, then you map that trivially to letters, and that's it, okay? But that's not feasible for several reasons. First of all, um, synthesis is, uh, has a certain probability of failure at every step. So if I tell you that the probability of having a letter attached is 99%, that means that when I reach about 100 nucleotides, I'm 36%. At 200 nucleotides, I have a 13% chance of actually reaching uh, a molecule of that size. So, First thing we need to do is we need to chop it up. Okay, so the way we do this, if we had a file, a piece of data that's, that's very long, think of it billions, trillions of, of bits, okay? We're gonna chop it up into pieces and encode it into multiple molecules, okay? But once I do that, I have to encode the ordering information into the data itself. So, we, so this is the payload, that's the data I have to now encode where that payload maps to in the original um, bits in, in the original data. And I also need a way of actually referring to the whole file as a unit. So that's what we're gonna use what we call primers. We're gonna come back to that later. So primer is something that's used um, for a very common molecular biology uh, process called polymerase chain reaction that's used to replicate DNA. Okay, but think of it right now as just as an address for the file. Okay, so this special sequences that I put in the beginning and the end are just the ID of the file, and then within uh, the file, since I have to encode in multiple molecules, I have to encode the address uh, within the, the value of the file, okay? Great. So now the question is, how do we do random access? Again, so nature has figured that out, which is amazing, right? So have, have you guys, who here heard of PCR before? Okay, about a third of you. Okay, great, so PCR is this fascinating um, process that allows you to selectively amplify some DNA molecules in the pool. Okay, this is something that happens all the time, very like the most basic thing you can do with molecular biology. We're actually using that to do random access uh, in DNA storage, okay? So here's what I mean by random access. Suppose that I have a test tube here that has three, fly, three files, okay? A blue file, a green file, and a red file, okay? And each file has a bunch of molecules, as I, sh as I showed before, that you know, maps to the different uh, parts of the data, okay? What if I want to get only the blue file? What I do is I actually use these primers here to selectively amplify only what I need. So if I go uh, and amplify only blue by a significant factor, I'm going to have a lot more blue than anything else. Then what happens if I take another sample? Now I'm going to get mostly blue. Then I go and sequence that, okay? So you know, it's, that is very, very simple um, too, but there's a bunch of tricks. Like for example, how do you actually pick which primers you want in a way that you know it's gonna amplify well? How do you map addresses, file names and file addresses to primers is another interesting research question that we are um, exploring now, okay? Th that's another interesting thing to keep in mind is that reads are uh, destructive. 
because you actually mess up with your sample to actually be able to read it. That means that if you read it enough, you have to replenish it, okay? But remember that this is archival, uh, this is archival storage, so reads are actually the uncommon case. The common case is writing, okay? So normally you only tap into archival when you're in trouble, either with the law or because of an accident and so on, right? So um, anyway, so reads are uncommon, so hopefully you're not gonna have to do that too much. Good. So here's some other encoding considerations that are interesting that we tend, uh, we, we tend not to think about with digital storage. The first thing is some sequences are better than others. For example, homopolymers tend to not be good for multiple reasons. Homopolymers are sequences that have repeated letters. Okay, so they make the molecule, they make the molecule fragile, they make them harder to read in some sequencing technologies and so on. So we need a coding scheme that avoids homopolymers, okay, as much as possible. Then the other thing is, uh, you could be unlucky and form a secondary structure. As you know, DNA sticks in a programmable way. What if you had a single molecule that forms what we call a hairpin? Uh, that actually makes it harder to retrieve later. So our encoding scheme also has to avoid or reduces the chances that this will happen. And you know, um, it turns out that this is hard when you're talking about a very, very large number of species, a very large number of different molecules, okay? So we need to, we need to avoid that. Okay. The other thing that's important is error correction. It turns out that both DNA sequencing and DNA synthesis are um, error prone, okay? And there's three forms of, of errors. One is say that this, that this is the original sequence that you want to make a DNA molecule for. You could have insertions, okay? We have a letter that was there, it was supposed to be there. You have deletions, you miss a letter, okay? Or you could have substitutions where you just have the wrong letter in that position, okay? Most storage work by the way, every single memory today has some form of error correction, okay? So DRAM has ECC, you have a bunch of other error correction schemes for permanent storage and so persistent storage and so on. But for the most part, we target substitutions. And networking codes have been targeting insertions, deletions. So we need a coding scheme that actually covers insertions, deletions, and substitutions, okay? So we have one. And the error here, by the way, that we, that we observed is about 1%. We wanna talk more about this later, so. So the way we deal with error correction is by adding logical redundancy. So essentially, when we're encoding data, we're going to encode uh, data into multiple strands. As I said, and we're gonna add some extra uh, DNA here that's just there to encode redundancy for the original data. Okay, so if you use something like an XOR redundancy, which is a very, very simple form of parity, say that I have piece of data A, piece of data B, and A XOR B, with, with only two, so having any two, I can recover the third one, right? So if I have A and A, X, or B, I can just do X, or again and get the B back and so on. Okay, so that's the simplest form. And then, and then you can do very sophisticated uh, error corrections with you know, uh, uh, locally decidable parity checks and read Solomon and so on, and we're experimenting with a bunch of those, okay? So, yeah, so that's the idea. So we um, did the new coding scheme, we did random access, and we sketched what the system looked like. And we also did a bunch of, um, uh, wet lab experiments. Let me tell you about wet lab experiments now and I can't resist showing this cute, this looks like us in the lab, no, and yeah. So here's the process so far. We started with a picture of a cat, okay, because people like cats and computer scientists like cats. We encode in DNA, uh, and cats are great because they're very easy to encode in DNA. You can just encode cat, cat, and GG, you know, yeah, ha, ha. That's, that's good, come on, guys. <laughs> Thank you, all right, somebody laughed here. Okay, so you, you encode the picture, we use a bunch of images because images are, uh, they take a lot of space and they have interesting properties. So we encode into uh, nucleotide sequences, we send this to a company that actually manufactures the DNA, we email them the sequence, okay? So they make it and they send a FedEx back to us, uh, and then we amplify it, you know, we do the selective uh, amplification, we sequence it in the lab, and then we recover uh, and we might have errors and we can just go and recover the data back. We've done this multiple times, okay? So we've actually recovered bit by bit. But right now we actually, the throughput of this storage system that includes FedEx and email, you know, is uh, uh, megabytes per week, okay? We're gonna talk about how we get, to how to make it faster later. So here's the experiment we've done. We've encoded three images, about 150 kilobytes, and we selected one image uh, to sh demonstrate random access and only get that, and we should we can recover everything bit by bit and only that image. Okay, um, and redundancy is super important for several reasons. We have errors, as I said, but also there's some sequences, some DNA sequences that are completely missing when you sequence, like things just disappear because it's, I guess, a, such, such a complex process that you're bound to lose data, so you have to be, you, you need a very, very good error correction uh, scheme, okay? Here's another interesting uh, 
analysis that we, that we did, we're trying to figure out whether most of the errors come from synthesis or from sequencing, okay? The way we did that um, was as follows. So there's two basic ways you can do synthesis. I mentioned uh, the cheaper parallel way, which is what we use that's viable. You grow a bunch of DNA in a surface, like in, a, in, a, in an array. That tends to be more error prone than doing one at a time, what we call column synthesis. It's much, much more expensive, but it's very, very high quality, okay? Well, what we did was the following. We actually got uh, some data and use array, cheap, lower quality synthesis, sequence, and we look at the synthesis plus sequencing errors. That's the, uh, the blue line here. And then, and then we got some sequences and then synthesized using this much more expensive but very, very, very precise gold standard way, okay? And, we, and then we sequenced, and in the same sequencing run, we got the green line. So the difference between these two here, that's synthesis errors, and everything else is sequencing errors. Okay, that's kind of interesting. The sequencing errors tend uh, to, to dominate. Okay, so it's about 1% sequencing and like 0.1% synthesis, okay? All right, here's another question that we get a lot. You know, can a monster grow out of my data? So say that one day in the future you have DNA uh, archiving and backing up your data in Dropbox. Could you magically upload a sequence you know, that would map to sequence of DNA that happens to be smallpox, that happens to be you know, the DNA sequence for Godzilla that's just gonna emerge out of your data and so on. And this is definitely something that you know, needs consideration. Okay, so we think that the chances of this being uh, a biohazard is low for several reasons, okay? The first one is that um, there's no cellular mechanism. All the DNA that we're talking about here is dehydrated in vitro. There's, there's, no, there, there, there's no contact with anything that could make proteins that actually lead to life, okay? So, and uh, second, the strands that we're talking about here are between 100 and 200 nucleotides. So they're very, very short to, go, to code for anything viable, okay? And finally, we put a bunch of restrictions in what sequences are allowed. For example, no homopolymers and a bunch of other restrictions that would make uh, the chances of this uh, being viable uh, very, very low. Okay, great. So let me stop and, and uh, think for a second. So how do we do this? Now, we, right now we are at the megabytes per week and we wanna be at gigabytes per second. So you can do the math here, but that's about nine orders of magnitude uh, improvement, okay? So uh, it turns out that there is um, this uh, person called Robert, Robert Carlson that actually spent some time in the department. He's been collecting a lot of really interesting data on DNA productivity, okay? So uh, this is essentially showing how DNA sequencing, that's the green line, and synthesis is improving over time. It's actually improving very, very fast, especially sequencing, it's being proving faster than Moore's law. And then there's, you know, there's a lot of room to grow. And uh, from talking to a bunch of people, I think it's clear that DNA sequencing will be uh, there. It actually will be fast enough for us to, to actually use this for, for storage. But now, synthesis is a different story, okay? Because there's, there's a bunch of reasons of that. First of all is there's a market reason. You know, what's this, the size of, uh, you know, the cost is actually gonna go only as high, you know, as low as the people willing do people are actually willing to pay a fair amount of money for it because right now it's ready in the noise for biomedical applications. There's no reason to go low. But if you actually show that DNA can be useful for storage, we can create a whole new market and uh, essentially you know, create incentives for the price to keep going down. So that's the economic reason. So now the technical reason is that you know, DNA for storage does not have to be perfect. As I mentioned before multiple times, you know, uh, we, computer science, you know, coding theorists are very, very good at creating error correcting codes, okay? It's amazing that wireless communication works at all. You know, you want something more noise than wireless communication, it still, it works really well, right? So it means we can live with very noisy DNA, and in fact, uh, we can live with not having a single DNA sequence be perfect for uh, DNA storage, but that's not the case for biomedical applications. So by allowing the DNA synthesis process to be sloppy, we think there's a lot of room to improve uh, the, the DNA synthesis process and we need very, very little material, okay? So here's another thing I think is worth mentioning. It's worth thinking about sequencing technology. So, um, you know, the, the gold standard right now, the most common is what uh, Illumina makes, you know, say that they dominate the market of DNA sequencing right now. Um, they make equipment that look like this and you know, they look about the size of a small fridge, okay? And now there's some emerging sequencing technologies. One is called nanopore, that's about the size of, you know, this laser pointer here, okay? Um, I mean, it, and it, it 
seems to work. I mean, the, the air rates is not as good as the more expensive, bigger machines, but they're getting there. And they work in a fascinating way. In fact, there's some technology out of UW that's in these devices. Here's how they work, okay? So they have um, what we call nanopore, which is a protein that has a little hole in the center. And as DNA goes through, you can actually measure perturbations in the current going, flowing through that pore. And you can look at, you can decode that into the DNA sequences. So that can be made, um, you know, I can imagine this being denser, this being fast, it's error prone, but again, we know how to deal with errors. And when I look at this, but we, I can't help but think about the following, like are we going from a fridge to a palm size thing, and like we used to have mainframes that it was a miniaturization. So I think this shows that the, the trend is going the right direction for this to be viable for other, um, other applications, okay? Now, um, I've been spending some time with, uh, quite a bit of time with folks uh, in, in biology, both with, with uh, Tom Daniel and uh, in the biology department, David Baker in the biochemistry department. And we've been looking at the potential of actually building computers uh, by combining silicon technology and, and biology. And we arrive at some numbers that I think are really interesting. For example, you know, I, I talked about storage so far, and then we talk, we're talking about a billion times denser with very, very uh, good durability. Okay. And then if you look at, for example, looking at potential, the potential of using proteins for computation, we're talking about a 10,000 10, X uh, potential compared to where transistor would probably ever be. Okay? I'm not talking about quantum and other technologies, I'm talking about just transistor technology and CMOS. Um, and I think that's remarkable. And finally, you know, we, we can sense things that are hard to do with silicon. Just think about this example here again, right? So. Um, the, the kind of the sensor here, part of the sensor is actually a protein that sits on top of an electronic circuit that helps us sense things that would be very hard to do with silicon alone, okay? So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities there. So anyways, that's it, that's what I wanted to say. I'm willing to take a bunch of questions, so please ask questions. Thank you. <laughs> Scott, yeah. So if a DNA base can theoretically encode two bits of information. How far away from that density are you right now? Good question. So there's, a, there's two components of density here, right? One is there's a lot, let's call logical density, how many bits per nucleotide we can encode. And as Scott said, uh, the, um, the, the limit would be two bits, right? Um, we don't use uh, base four because of the homopolymer. We talked about to actually use base three. So we're roughly at 1.5 bits per nucleotide. That's where we're at right now. But that's just one part of the story. The other part of the story that each density is what, what I'm calling you know, physical redundancy, that you need multiple copies of a, of a molecule. And right now, we, we're using some of the order of you know, millions of copies, but we're estimating uh, that uh, we will only need a few hundred, maybe a thousand copies. And what's interesting is that this it depends on what's your target uh, retrieval time because these molecules decay over time. And the way you provide for that is you provide more copies. And if you know the decay rate and you know that you're gonna retrieve in a thousand years, you can compute how many, how many copies you need. So this is why the answer to your question, it depends on your target rate. Right now, you know, we have millions of copies because that's what we are doing, but we, uh, we expect this when, when this works. I expect this to be on the order of hundreds, maybe thousands of copies but not much more than that. So you lose about two to three orders of magnitude there and, use a, and you lose a little bit uh, in the logical redundancy. So thanks for that question, I love that, yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked about errors in the data. Uh, what about errors in your addressing and uh, identification? How critical are those, especially if you to have a lot of different pieces of memory in one okay. day, like you have a lot of, uh, and that's a challenge. Excellent question. So the, the question I uh, was, now, how do we deal with errors in the control sequence, like in the addresses and so on? So errors in the primers aren't uh, that problematic because eventually if you have a, a, an error here and there, you can still amplify the molecule. But if you have errors in the address, then we also have to provide redundancy in the address scheme itself. And this is what uh, the, the current scheme that we have with XOR, the first scheme that we had with XOR did not do very well with that. So we, we were betting on having enough molecules and we have a few of them who actually had the, the address correct. But in our new coding scheme, we actually add redundancy to the address itself. And not only that, we actually repeat the address in multiple parts of the payload such that we can increase the chances of getting the address correct. That's a fantastic question. I think your calculation for the data density relies on um, uh, just the, well, 
how many bits per uh, per base, and then some redundancy. But uh, what about the, all the infrastructure that you need around it? So I, I think you probably can't have a big bucket where you have all the DNA and you sort of mix it uh, mix it together. So there's a lot of hardware around it. And uh, how much would that take? Or you suspect that the moment it would probably totally dominate the yeah, absolutely. Space. That's definitely a big question. We're going to have to speculate to it as well, right? So the question was the following. We're talking about the density of the data itself, but then you know you have a little thing that needs a giant thing to work with, so how you have to amortize this. You're right, so that means that you know, the most direct answer is that we're gonna have to put a lot of data to be able to amortize the equipment. So, but uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that you know, the equipment, the access magnet is actually shrinking. The reads, we, uh, you know, nanopores are starting to be viable, so imagine that's gonna shrink the read mechanism quite a bit too. Uh, synthesis, you know, at least chemical uh, synthesis using characters chemistry, which is the most popular way of doing it. There's no reason why the equipment, the, the equipment has to be big. This hasn't been optimized for uh, size yet, so I think we can shrink by a significant margin, but it's, it's not going to be, you know, tiny. So that means that I would probably have a few hours of magnitude to go in, in reducing the size of the equipment, but we still have gonna have to put a lot of data to amortize the access mechanism so. It's a good question, and there's some, we cannot go below a certain limit, yeah. So that means that we're betting we're gonna have a lot of data to amortize that. <laughs> yeah? I mean, this is a little bit out there, but what do you think about rewritable DNA oh. data storage? Excellent question, so what do I think about rewritable uh, DNA? Um, well, we actually thought a little bit about thought a little bit about this, you know, there's, I'm sure you've heard in the news, there's this technology called CRISPR, right, they can actually write DNA in place, which I think is fantastic. Uh, does it have a place in storage? Uh, I'm unsure, I can, I can see it both ways. So, on the one hand, it would be great to just for you to be able to write in place, right, be writing in place. On the other hand, you know, uh, DNA should be so abundant that you should never need to delete anything, you just do incremental writes. And by the way, we do that in storage systems today, log, log structured file system, for example, things that you have in USB, like in flash, you never write in place, you always write into a new place, and you only overwrite when you run out of space. So I think we should use something like that in the logic as a logical layer, never have to rewrite anything. But uh, that said, I think it would be very interesting to look at um, DNA editing and CRISPR-like technologies for rewritability. Question, yeah, Max. Could you design sequences that deliberately decompose, that have a certain half-life so that, uh, I don't know, my, uh, my old tax forms uh, decompose on the right schedule, something like that? Excellent question. Uh, yeah, so that, that's definitely, we, we pondered, you know, encoding keys um, in a way that, you know, you're gonna de decay faster or expose it to UV to destroy it for real and so on. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, th I think the answer is yes, you can probably do that. But if there's another, do you mind if I modify your question just a little bit? So the, the, the other um, interesting question here related to that is how do you delete data? Okay, so it turns out that you, know, you can encode data in a very compact way and you can imagine encoding in a, such a compact way that I can put it here and then if I don't tell someone that there's data there, you're never gonna know, you're gonna have to go, right? So you can just you can hide it. So how do you know that you've actually deleted all the information when you have to have physical access to so data? And I think that you can't ever prove that you, you actually deleted the data. So that's the opposite of your question. So the way I think we'll deal with that is be very good at encrypting everything and do key management in the right way. So if you're gonna delete something, you're gonna throw the keys away. Because I don't think you can ever guarantee that you've actually deleted the data, uh, not nearly with the same level of confidence that we have with uh, digital storage today, right? So great question. I don't have a, an answer, so I just have a comment, I guess. <laughs> More questions? Great, let's thank right. Luis. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. Yeah.